Welcome hackers to Attack on Tuesday. My name is Taggart and on tonight's stream we are going to be doing some Windows privilege escalation. Move that microphone a little bit closer so we can get a little bit less echo. That's a little bit better, I hope. So this is a continuation of some work that we've been doing and uh, this is a try hack me room that we have started. This is Windows Privesk version 1.0 if you want to follow along. And we were about halfway through, but just to give you a run through of what we're doing, what we're, what we're doing is we're, once we have a foothold on a Windows system, we need to figure out where to go next. And one of the places that we want to go other than pivoting laterally throughout the network is to elevate our privileges. Odds are when we get on the Windows system, we didn't have the system privileges or even administrator privileges on the, on the machine. So how do you get them? This is what privilege escalation is all about. So one of the, some of the things that we talked about to gain those elevated permissions would be insecure service permissions, the ability to stop and start uh, different permissions, or sorry, different services, and uh, replace the binary path related to that service with a binary of your choosing. You could use you know, whatever payload you want for that. And when it reruns, it, it may run with system privileges, right? So that would become, if a, with a reverse shell or something like that, that would become your privilege escalation. Same thing with unquoted service paths, rather than running the executable that the service is expecting. Uh, if, the service, if the service path is unquoted, you may be able to hijack that path and put a binary someplace writable by you that would replace that binary in the uh, in the executable. Same thing with registry permissions. If there's weak registry permissions, you may be able to write something um, to get, uh, you know, an auto run or something to uh, fire off with a binary of your choosing. And we finished up last time looking at the security account manager, SAM and system files and how to extract hashes from there. And that's where we are. We've actually we've actually cracked the password um, here using Hashcat, and we have the hash as well. But what we're going to start with tonight is without even cracking the password, we have the ability to run a pass the hash attack, which can also get us authenticated, not even as the um, without even having to crack the password. So that's going to be what we start with now. It has a, there's a kind of easy mode uh, command built into Kali Linux, right? With the uh, PTH, with WinXE, right? And we can use that, but um, since we have the hash, right? We have the hash here. That's kind of, um, yeah, it's, well, we actually have the NTLM hash here as well. So it might actually be more interesting for us to try to use this um, rather than um, oh, there's our hash right there. So it may be it may be more interesting for us to use this rather than um, you know cracking the password. But um, we also have some other tools we can use to attempt to pass the hash. For example, a crack map exec. And we might want to try that as well. So let's first of all see what crack map exec can give us on this device just uh, without without any privileges. So let's confirm that we can see this thing. We can, great news. And then let's run crack map exec. And let's, uh, well, actually, before we even run that, let's see if SMB client can give us anything on here. Let's see if there are any shares available to us. Okay, I can't do it with, uh, with my own user, but let's see if we can do it with, like, a null user. Nope, nothing there. Well, let's see what we can do with crack map exec then. So... Let's uh, cat out the admin hash. All right, we can use that then. And with crack map exec, uh, you know what? Before we even do that, let's um, let's real quick run just an nmap scan. 
uh, against the Windows machine, just so we know everything that's up and running on here. Looks like something might have happened to my VPN connection. Maybe it's just blocking our ping attempts, so we'll try without ping. Although we were getting a ping from it before, so that's a little concerning. This is the second time I've had trouble with Try Hack Me in as many days. Might have to try re-downloading the VPN package or something like that. Curiouser and curiouser. I wonder if something just went wrong with this machine. Which would be annoying. spin back up and let's take a look at the crack map exec options that we would have here so let's say that we have the ability to work over uh, SMB which we should what we'll be able to do from there is provide hash um, and that should help us out with authentication through crack map exec and of course we'll try the easy mode on this one too all right it's up but it's a Windows machine so I don't know if it's up up just yet you know sometimes it takes more than a minute but I will see if I'm able to at least talk to it. Okay, all of those routes look correct. Oh my god, I know what's wrong.
I know what's wrong. Uh... At least I thought I did. There's only the one I thought I might have had uh, two network connections open, uh, two network interfaces uh, enabled, and sometimes that messes with things. But that doesn't appear to be the situation here. Uh, I'm looking at, yeah, there's only one network adapter enabled, so it should be fine. There we go. Okay, so we're getting if the, the machine finally came back up. So hopefully that'll that'll stay that'll stay up for us. And let's see what's open. Okay, so we have 445. So there is SMB open, and of course there's RDP as well. But let's see if we can do... I just saw the VPN do another a weird thing. Yeah, see, I lose the connection then. Interesting. Why do I have two different tunnels open? I shouldn't. I have other VPN jobs. Uh, Alright, that should do it. <laughs> Alright, let's try the easy way, right? Let's try to pass the hash with the PTH win XE. So let's cat that admin hash out again. We're coming to you live from an active crime scene at an electronic component. There we go. Let's do PTH, not path, but PTH. Make this a little bit bigger, a little bit easier for you to see. PTH dash win XE with a user of admin percent and then we'll give the hash at whoops 10.10.160.69 and we'll try cmd.exe see how that goes oh we need the full hash not just the, uh, so the full hash is right here. Let's try that again. totally works, right? But now, let's try it with crack map exec, just to see if we can do it. Uh, 
and we'll do h of that and we'll do what is it username of admin and we'll try uh i need to give the ip address don't i <laughs> would help The hash worked, but we weren't able to get starting S we couldn't get SMB going, which is interesting. Oh, do I need to run it with sudo? some errors here. Well, I guess that works, kind of. It's just that we don't we don't get any output from it. All right, let's call that a day then for that one. Scheduled tasks. Now for this one, we're gonna have to remote in, and we're gonna remote in as our default user, which is user with password 321. Oh, funny. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is schedule tasks, which is a good one. So we're going to use the schedule tasks tool to see dev tools clean up PS one. Let's let's first take a look. Okay, I have mt.exe. This is my reverse shell. Although, I do not at all remember <laughs> how I made it. So I might... I might remake it. Sounds good to me. set the payload correctly.
All right, so we've got a reverse handler going, waiting for our reverse shell. That's good. And then... Let's uh, load up the payload here. And we'll do that just by... Let's get PowerShell going. And we'll CD downloads, right? And then we will... That's very small. Let's see if we can make that font a little bit bigger for everybody. Better. Okay. Now, if Windows Defender were on this thing, this would not work because it would see the interpreter payload, which is not obfuscated in any way, and say, get out of here. But, because that's not happening, we certainly have uh, the ability to download this payload. Now, for services, so let's see. Let's take a look first. Uh, this is a little bit um, unclear. It's telling us to modify a script, but we don't know why we're doing it. So let's first take a look at and schedule tasks. And we can we don't have to do this in PowerShell. We can do this in the ta in the task viewer as well. And let's just take one of these as an example. Now, I believe there is also, there's a PowerShell version of this. I was using the SCA tasks. Um, but let's, let's see what the PowerShell version of this is. Yeah, get scheduled tasks. So let's do that. Let's do get scheduled task now here's the thing to know about working with um, objects in PowerShell they are objects right if you're used to working in the Linux command line like I am one of the things that is a real adjustment is that it's not just plain text that's getting created right these are all objects and the properties of the objects that you see here are not necessarily all of the objects that you see, uh, all of the properties that it has. So for example, if I do, there's the save cred. I don't know what this is, but it looks weird. Let's look for that task name. So if I do get scheduled task, task name is probably the, uh, is probably the argument or the parameter. Right, so we see that it gives us this save cred, but if I pipe this to uh, FL or format list, same thing, what I'll find is that the object actually has a lot more properties, right? There's all this extra stuff in here that we didn't see before. And let's see how that compares to what we get from SCA tasks.
you see that we don't get nearly as much. Um, although, if we give it the verbose, we may get more out. Let's give it the verbose output. So that's kind of a lot. Now, let's see if we can get, get scheduled task. Let's run get help on it and read the documentation. So we actually get more back from the skatasks.exe just because what we 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 see this uh, this path to c uh, save cred dot bat. And it looks like we don't get as much oh here we go. It's it was a get schedule task info. Yeah. So let's try that. Let's try get schedule task info. I'm not getting a whole lot more information from this. We don't see that we don't see that executable which is really interesting okay but either way that is not the schedule task that we're supposed to be working with here right because it's not this cleanup.ps1 and let's see Let's just look at our scheduled tasks in the window version of this. The script seems to be running a system every minute. And yet, where are we seeing that?
As a matter of fact... Well, let's, let's do this. Let's type cdevtoolscleanup.ps1 just to see what's there. It says this script will clean up all your old dev logs every minute to avoid permission issues run a system. But, it doesn't seem like I'm seeing it really uh, obviously here. Right, the only thing that looks really weird is this save cred. Let's take a look. Its triggers are at logon, right? So it's not actually a save cred.pad, it's a different job. So this is a very strange uh, objective here because we shouldn't have to do this uh, without you know, seeing the task first. And if it is running, I'd like to know where it's running from. And we have Procmon here. Let's, uh, let's open this up and see what's going on. And we've already cracked this password, but... try to filter where the path contains C uh, dev tools add apply here we go so we're seeing PowerShell uh, hit this uh, again and again And the parent PID was 808. So we'll reset the filter. We'll reset and we'll make a new filter for PID. It is 808, just so we can learn what this thing is. It's probably going to be, I guess, VC host or something. It is. So the reason why we didn't see it is because it wasn't really a scheduled task. It was actually a service, um, even though it said scheduled tasks. So this this objective here was actually a little bit poorly named, I have to say, because what we would think of as scheduled tasks are, you know, the scheduled tasks. But this thing is running as a service. And uh, to see those, we use different tools. Right? So, if we think in um, in command line, we would do uh, sc dot, sc dot exe, uh, sc dot exe query. And that gives us uh, all of these. Now, we don't know which one it is. 
there's this weird win XE service I saw. That's a kind of weird. That might be something to look up. We can also, of course, look at these in the services GUI. You know what? I'm switching to Vaporwave. Now we have no idea. Which one of these it is. So we would be looking for things that are running, for one. And we would also be looking for things that are local system. Right. if we wanted to know exactly what service was uh, actually running this. And this one looks pretty weird because it doesn't have a description, right? Um, this looks like our culprit here. Winexec svc.exe. That's it. Doesn't tell us a whole lot. I suspect if we were to look at Winexec svc.exe, it would tell us something about uh, running that that PS file, that PowerShell file. So you just you always want to investigate as far as you can with that. But what it's telling us to do now is to use access check, uh, which we have in the Privesk folder. And what accesscheck.exe does, once we accept the EULA, which we do via the command line, is we do a check for, uh, yeah, Q for uh, scheduled tasks or services, right? Let's, let's actually just um, run it without, oh, Q is omit banner. And U is suppress errors, V, and W. So, okay. So basically, right. Another way we could have gotten there without the instructions is have Procmon actually show us how many times this file uh, was getting accessed, right? We would have been able to see something like that. Even if we had done something like a uh, filter for uh, like the path contains PS1, because that can be a tell, right? If somebody's left a, uh, a PowerShell script kicking around that they're using with incorrect permissions, that could be a huge tell for us. Right? And that's exactly what's happening here. So this tells us that built-in users have read-write to this thing. 
um, which means that we can edit it. Right? So if we run notepad.exe on C dev tools cleanup.ps1, this is fine. We'll let it do that. But then we're also going to do C users user um, I think that's right yeah lowercase u downloads mt.exe Just save that up and then wait. And without waiting like at all, we got ourselves some interpreter session on there. Let's get a shell. It should be a system shell. Uh, what? Something has gone terribly wrong. <laughs> Something went wrong with the interpreter, it looks like. So we'll restart it. I've never seen that before. Let's set up the handler again. Okay. Yes, I'm being lazy and using the up arrow. But with this kind of experience, how can you prove that, as it were, it's not going on in their head? It's their experience. That Alrighty. Be proved in any way beyond, 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 beyond. Looks good. And we should get another one of these in a second, right? If the uh, the service is running every minute. So again, this isn't really a scheduled task. This is a service. There we go. There's our <laughs> there's our session. Why don't I have a shell on here? So what? You can't sleep? I can. I just go nuts. I can. I keep getting more and more sessions, but. Actually, let me get rid of this line then to stop that from happening. But why? I've never seen that happen before. Yeah, what is this?
Okay. Whoa. All the stuff that I'm used to seeing is not here. Why is that true? The MSF Venom payload looks okay. If shell disappears, reboot. Well, that sucks, but it's fine. Actually, I want to try one thing just before I... Okay, we don't do MSF update anymore, right? I don't like rebooting as a solution, so I'm going to see if I can reinstall some stuff, or update some stuff and see how we can do. Well, meanwhile, let's move on to the next one of these. And I'll just not use... I'll just not use um, Metasploit stuff if they ask us to. Okay, so we're still our desktop in here as the regular user. And so this is an insecure GUI app. This is kind of a cool one. I've seen this before. So what we'll do is we'll RDP, or so we're RDP'd in, we're gonna double click the admin page shortcut on our desktop. Let's close this. Admin paint. And what is this? This is a really fun thing, so look at this. It's run as dot exe. So run as is kind of like, kind of like sudo on Linux. Think of it like you're going to be able to run something as a specific user. Notice that the user is admin with a saved cred. So if there's a saved credential, then it will use it um, rather than prompting for a credential. And then mspaint.exe. Now, what can we do now that we have paint opened as admin? It turns out that paint can open cmd.exe if we do it that way I guess yep <laughs> that's interesting
So the real the real giveaway there, or the real vulnerability, is that nobody should be using run as with save cred. Right? That was our way in. Now here it tells us um, to look for startup apps, but we might not know. It's kind of, this one's telling us where to look for startup apps, but we might not know where to look for startup apps. So one thing that we can do is do I have it? I should have it in downloads. Do I not? Okay, um, let's go get it then. We need from sys internals. We're going to need auto runs. Yep. going to need this DLL and just in case it does I probably should just bring the whole zip over so let me set up a, a Python listener to grab it and get it over onto our desktop here and we'll do the same thing IWR to RI and I think it's about 20. Auto runs dot zip file. Auto runs dot zip. <laughs> and we'll just extract all right here. And let's run auto run 64. Agree. So what auto runs is gonna do is look everywhere in the operating system for things that run automatically. Whether it's in the startup programs folder, whether it's in the registry, all sorts of great places that we can maybe check. Um, including you gotta love those set scheduled tasks. There's that save cred that we saw before. Services, sort of the same thing. Also, registry locations that you would check for these sorts of things, and it's doing that for us. Current control set services, current control set. Now, the other thing that we can always check is uh, in here, the program data, Microsoft Windows, start menu, program startup. This is kind of an old school place to look for stuff, but there might be something here. So 
it's again using access check to uh, check that out and it's checking a directory. We're checking C. I've got to give it the dash D. C. Program. Nope. Program files. Program data. And what's the rest of the path? Microsoft Windows Start Menu Programs. So it looks like admin can read and write here, um, and built-in users can only read. So as a user, we don't have much. Oh, did I do the wrong? I did, I did the wrong location. So interestingly, yes, yeah, startup can be re read and written by all built-in users. So let's try. Let's get that. Let's see if I can get the my Metasploit console running correctly this time. That was concerning. Says using C script, run the C privesque create shortcut VVS script, which will create a new shortcut to your reverse.exe executable in the. Uh, I don't like that. Yeah, that sucks. We shouldn't rely on this script. And first of all, the reverse.exe is hard coded, and that's not the file name I used. So instead, let's learn how to do this right. Uh, it looks like basically we do have to use W script to do it. Okay, well, in that case, we're at least going to modify the thing to uh, use our own file name. T.LNK, just because. Okay, so it's supposed to be C script, right? That exe, and we'll do create shortcut. .vbs. All right. Now that should fire off for everybody. And so if I Oops. 
I create a our desktop connection as admin here. So the next, basically we're simulating the next time that the admin logs in, in this case, with this password. see if anything fun is happening. A bunch of stuff is happening over there. Let's actually see if uh, something went went in there. It did. Oh, there we go. Whoa, interpreter session one is not valid and will be closed. I think something must have happened with the um, the payloads. So we're gonna rerun MSF Venom here. And re-download the new the new payload now that it's built. Okay, and let's try that our desktop trick again. So we have two remote desktop sessions running. Oh, pause that. I would have to... No, the job is still running. Let me see if I can fire it off manually. Hmm. That's concerning. Interpreter session two is not valid and will be closed. I don't like that this is a newish issue. But it's closed.
payload's correct, Windows X64 Meterpreter. Oh, no, it's not! That's the whole problem. Okay. This should be Meterpreter, not Shell. to detail pays off. Now I might have to do it this way, right? To basically kill the session to bring it back to trigger startup for admin. Hmm. Or, you know, not. Oh, sign out. Try that again. Okay, so now the startup stuff should be happening again. We'll see if we get a another shell here. Yeah, we do. You know what? That was probably the problem before. Um, the mismatch between the payload and the, uh, the listener. So I'm admin on the shell, so that worked out swimmingly. Close out of that. All right. Now, I'm familiar with Potato Attack, but only kind of. I think it's worth looking up and learning a little bit more about rather than just running this blindly. So let's learn about the Potato Attack. Now, this is technically the rogue potato attack, but I think the hot potato attack came first. So it uses NTLM relay, HTTP SMB relay, and NBNS spoofing in a BIOS name system. Windows, many organizations rely on Windows account privileges to protect their corporate network. Often it's the case that once an attacker is able to gain high privilege access, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what we do is we set up first a local NBNS spoofer. Okay, and then... WPAD proxy server. So we're spoofing WPAD to get get that going.
Okay. Oh, and here's just like all of the, all of the potatoes. So we're using a rogue. Now, do we have SoCat installed? We do. The SoCat, if you're not familiar with it, is a... Uh, think of it as like a leveled up Netcat. That's uh, maybe a good way to think about it. Command line based utility establishes two bi bi directional byte streams, transfers data between them. So here we're going to do sudo socat cp listen 35 reuse address fork and sixty. Yeah, that's right. And that. Hey Gromit, what's going on? Alright, the SoCat is set up here. And then we have to simulate getting a service account shell by logging into RDP as the admin user, starting an elevated command prompt, and using psexec64 to trigger the reverse executable you created with the permissions of the local service account. Okay. What do I think about the Colonial Pipeline hack? Well, I think this was bound to happen. I think that the economic impact will result in some kind of regulation or legislation um, that may result in some kind of accountability basically for organizations that are negligent in their cybersecurity practices. I think the take that I, I most agree with is that we don't have an NTSB for cyber right now. So, you know, when a plane crashes, right, the National Transportation Safety Board comes in and does, you know, sometimes years long investigations into what happened. I don't know, I don't know if you would remember this, this was, it was before 9-11, but there was uh, TWA Flight 800. It was this horrible plane crash. 90, 96. Yeah, it was this horrible, horrible plane crash. The plane basically exploded off the, off the coast of New York. And we didn't really know what happened. And there were a lot of theories going around. And basically, whenever you look for pictures of this on the internet, what you're gonna find is work by the NTSB, like reconstructing the entire airplane out of debris that they found floating in the uh, in the East River or just the ocean. And truly, truly incredible work. We don't have a body like that in the United States for cyber. I don't think anybody has it and we need it plainly. That's one. Two, the findings from the NTSB result in regulatory penalties and consequences for organizations that don't abide by certain safety standards. It is now clear that ransomware attacks and other kinds of cyber attacks can have material impact on the United States. It's, it's a security issue 
but it's also a safety issue, right? If we can separate those a little bit. Um, this time it was a pipeline. It's not impossible that it could be um, sort of a power situation. So this winter, right, we saw Texas had a power outage that was caused by a natural disaster. But what if it hadn't been, right? What if it was, um, what if it was some other kind of cyber incident that resulted in in a, in what's the word I'm looking for? A prolonged power outage resulting in deaths because people couldn't get warm. Um, who's responsible for that? At the moment, nobody, basically, because we don't have a concept of cyber negligence. But there should be, and I think that's where we're going to end up. And. It's kind of a parallel to the social media situation we're seeing right now, or basically big big companies, but prim primarily social media, where they want they want <laughs> to set up their own regulations. Like that's why Facebook has its Supreme Court and everything, because they would much rather like regulate themselves than have federal regulations put upon them that may not be in their best interest. That's kind of where they are so i also i'm also sensitive to the fact that industrial control systems and and a lot of these kinds of major industries and and also healthcare where i work um there are a lot of legacy systems that are difficult to patch now i was in a webinar earlier today with john strand from uh black hills information security and he was saying like yeah i get it everybody's a special snowflake you know there are medical devices that you can't patch. There are industrial control systems you can't patch. There are military defense systems that you can't patch. But if everybody's special, then nobody is, and everybody's vulnerable, so what are you gonna do? Um, and the answer is, at some point, you're gonna have to bite the bullet and remediate the stuff, right? And the truth is that segmentation doesn't appear to be the panacea for this stuff that we thought it was, because all it takes is one goofball with a, a team viewer account to log into a sensitive workstation, right? And all of a sudden the water in Florida is poison. So um, I'll kind of step off the, the soapbox, but I think basically we're, we're coming to a reckoning and Darkseid knows that they stepped in it a little bit because they got way too much heat for this. They don't want an Interpol slash FBI uh, operation coming down on them because that hasn't really happened yet you know what i mean we have had um that kind of operation against ransomware groups that that we know of and some people will say that well dark side is russian maybe maybe not um and even if it is at that point you have to think about like when do you start considering this more of a national security issue and when do you start using those kinds of resources in defense because plainly if it is if it is a nation state that is executing these attacks it's no longer just military targets that they're going after right at which point the military can't just defend military targets the board the the safety that the united states has enjoyed from a physical standpoint, with its two oceans and friendly uh, neighbors to the north, north and south, no longer applies in the cyber realm. So the military has like a different job then, or whatever organization has a different job to like actually defend civilian assets that are clearly at risk from organized government, uh, foreign government operations. It's funny too, because we set up the Space Force, right? But we didn't set up the Cyber Force even though technically Space Force is really cyber, the, the backstory to Space Force is like a lot of the higher level officers in the DOD that went into cyber operations in the different branches, like Navy, Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, um, Coast Guard. They got to a, like, they couldn't advance past basically 06 or 07, like a first uh, one star general or a, a rear, uh, rear admiral because it's just not what the service was about like if you think about the highest ranking folks in the air force they were pilots right they were navigators <laughs> highest folks in the navy they were um command officers in surface warfare fleet 
or they were naval aviators, right? They were kind of in like the main communities in those services. The cyber folks didn't really have those opportunities. So to make those opportunities, they made this separate branch. They called it the Space Force because a lot of the cyber assets are satellites, but it's it's really a, a, as much a cyber operation as it is an aerospace operation. All right, what are we doing? We're doing this hot potato attack. So I gotta log in as admin here. Did I lose the connection? Yeah, I could I could talk for uh, quite some time about the cyber posture, um, especially the military cyber posture of the United States and what we should, what we aren't doing, but probably should. I think we basically timed out on this thing because it's not really two hours that you get with these machines. It's one hour that you get with these machines. This is Prince Spoofer. Okay. Well, this is just like running. I don't know. I feel like that's kind of lame. Let's, um,. Let's move over. So this is one of the Privesk rooms, but there was another one that I wanted to, to check out. Yeah, the the TCM room. Oh, Gromit. No, no apologies. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to hot take a little bit. It's a big story, man. I will say, one thing that's really interesting, here's here's a t for any viewers who are interested about uh, in ransomware what's going on, and the dark side group colonial and the colonial pipeline, this is a this is a worthy sidetrack. Oh, you're in New York, so it's getting hairy. So yeah, I mean, we haven't felt it in California yet, but I'm sure we're gonna feel it uh, in the wallet pretty soon. As as stockpiles are kind of relocated over to the east coast hope uh i hope everything is uh is sorted out soon and i hope you're safe but if you're cure if you're worried about ransomware in your organization and you want some like really easy things that you can do like tomorrow um at least on some endpoints to help out one of the things that i'm really interested in right now is this tool called raxine which Every single time I search for it, they think I mean Racine, Wisconsin. I don't. I mean Raxine right here. Uh, some. So, Raxine takes advantage of some of the things that ransomware has to do in order to be effective uh, as a data loss agent. Right? So, on a Windows endpoint, one of the things that ransomware must do is delete the volume shadow copies. Basically the restore points, if you're familiar with that in Windows, it has to delete those so you can't, you know, restore from them. And the way that Windows works is that those are held on like a tiny little partition that is separate from your main OS partition. So basically it just deletes those, but there's a specific way in which it does that or that you do it in Windows with VSS admin. And so what Raxine does is it so it registers this debugger which is raxine.exe and then anything that tries to run it it stops the execution of vss admin and then it kills the parent pit so anything that tries to make this happen through vss admin um and wmi is just killed now a lot of ransomware will just stop at that point Right now, this isn't a fix everything problem, but 
or this isn't a fix everything solution, but it's a really nice inoculation against a lot of common ransomware. Um, but of course the problem is that uh, legitimate uses of this are also disabled. So if you do use that for real in your organization, you're kind of host, but it may be worth it. So yeah, I'm going to be experimenting with this um, this week. I, I think probably Saturday stream will be focused on this a little bit and uh, other other techniques we can use to protect against ransomware. So what does TCM have for us? A lot of the same stuff. This one uses hot potato. Let's try, let's try user password three two one we'll fire this one up real quick and just see if we can do the um the hot potato attack desktop. Windows 7. Oh boy. Oof. No wonder we're using hot potato. Okay, so we're going to fire up PowerShell and we're going to import this module, which is the tater attack. But we're going to look at it first. Where's the was tools tater okay just kidding I guess we're not gonna look at it that much but the basic idea I think we pulled from the um, from here let's take a look at the hot potato attack So, hot potato was the first potato in the code name of Windows Privilege Escalation. So, here we see. Should be WPAD, I think, not WAPD. Yeah. So, you basically you set up the malicious WPAD spoofer, right? Guess the data, you need to perform NTLM authentication. There you go. That's how you get it. So, basically, it's an impersonation of WPAD. That's what's going on. Okay. Well, now we know that. So, what does it want us to do? It want us. It wants us to basically just run the PowerShell and then invoke Tater Trigger One Command. Let's import the module first.
Let's try it again. Weird. Okay, and then now we have that invoke tater um, commandlet. And what were the parameters here? Trigger dash one command. Maybe we'll just copy and paste this. So let's take a look at what it's doing here. I know it's a little bit hard to see. Let's see, let me make the font bigger. So what does it do? It fires up, it, uh, it spoofs W-pad. And then it flushes DNS cache. It starts the NBNS spoofer to resolve WPAD to localhost. Then HTTP request for WPAD.dat received. It tries to get hashes and trigger relay. HTTP request for download for this update. HTTP request for get hashes received. Okay, so basically, yeah, it just kind of does a local spoof. And then once it gets it, it uses the hash to authenticate and then executes a command. So if we do net user. Net local group administrators. Yeah, so now I'm an admin, which I wasn't before. Okay, that's really cool. All right, I think that's gonna do it for tonight. Um, I wanted to do a potato attack and clean up some of the other stuff. I know that we have some other things in here to do, but I think you know getting good at Windows privilege escalation and understanding what's going on in the system really helps once you get a foothold. Um, so that's kind of what this practice was for. But I think that's that's good for tonight. So I will be back tomorrow. Uh, doing some programming. We still have some more work to do on our text-based adventure uh, incident response game. So I'll be working on that tomorrow in Python. And then Saturday, uh, we're back in Blue Team. And as I said, we're going to do some experimentation with ransomware and how to prevent it. So we'll play with Raxine and some other tools as well. So until then, hackers, be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>